Again, thank you for joining us here or for joining us online. Uh, it is a, a privilege to be back here. And for some of you, I know you are celebrating within the win of the Dodgers. And the rest of you are in grief. And some of you will probably don't really care. So uh, thank you for uh, not blowing off today because you were celebrating yesterday. Uh, I'm Juno. And again, we are continuing in our series about what it means to be in, uh, in God's family. Right, and we're looking at the book in the New Testament, 1 Timothy. And it is a, a book that was written by an older pastor to a younger pastor. And it is a, a book that is, is telling us about the story of this guy taking over this, this church that had been around for a while and that it had had its own problems. Man, my uh, little tongue tie must be just excited about those Dodgers. Uh, I just need to focus here. Okay. Uh, and so again, uh, we started out the series just a couple weeks ago. And I had shared uh, about what Paul, how Paul, the writer, took seriously his call to this pastor role and that how God had commanded him and commanded Timothy to, to lead and to be a part of this church. Uh, t uh, Paul had talked about uh, some of the important things and that no matter what he did, he was to, to do them in love. And Paul also gave a huge warning about false teachers, about those who were just in it for wrong motives. And he compared them to, to, to these people. He compared them to, uh, uh, to rebels, to unholy people, to killers of fathers and mothers, to the sexually immoral, to slave traders and to liars. And so the writer of this book is just saying, Watch out, and these are just evil people. Last week, we were thankful that uh, Pastor Ryan had come back up here. We were all set. We had it videotaped in case he was not well. Uh, but we're thankful that he was up here, and we did not need a splash zone warning uh, for anybody. But, but Ryan talked again about Paul's conversion and about the grace of God that had been given to Paul and how Paul was to share that with others. And so that just brings us up to chapter two of this week. So let me pray one more time for us. Again, Lord, thank you for your love and your grace that we experience. Thank you for the freedom to meet together. For those checking us out, whether it's online or here in person, thank you. For those here with heavy hearts, thank you. For those who are here out of habit, Thank you. And we know that you are a God that somehow, some way, with the work of your spirit, you meet each and every one of us with our own needs. And we are grateful for that. And I just simply pray that the thoughts of the, on the hearts and on the minds of those here today, and that the words I share will be acceptable in your sight because you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So again, we are looking at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, which is on page 829 in those Bibles and the chairs in front of you. If you don't have one, consider yourself that you have one now and go ahead and take that home with you. But just let's look at that, just that first verse uh, for a moment. That sort of sets the tone for everything. I urge then first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. And as I read this and studied this, you know, and, and trying to come up, usually what happens, uh, I don't know how Ryan does it, but how I do it is, you know, you, you work on the message, you work on it, and then you finally come up with the title when you're all done. Uh, and sometimes working on that title takes a lot longer than the message. Or it's like, what do I say? How do I put, put, you know, a half hour into just a few words? And so as I looked it over, it really said to me that as, uh, Paul was talking about how to, set your, how to set and how to keep your priorities. 
And I realized this really wasn't just to, to Timothy who was helping lead the church, but it really is about every one of us who are in the church. More than once I have thought, I'm just gonna title the, the, the sermon, whatever the passage is. So today it would have been, you know, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 7. I would have been done, could have gotten the notes to the office so they can get it all in print and all that kind of fun stuff. But that just probably isn't creative enough for those of you who are wired to think creatively or the idea that the sermon title is the hook to get people into it and to even question or wonder what, how, what's he thinking? How is this tied in? Uh, but as I looked at it, again, uh, in, in 1 Timothy 2, it was obvious to me that this is really about praying. And, you know, Paul is just saying to Timothy, as you launch into this, you need to be a prayer. And I thought, oh, great. We just finished a series on prayer. Are people going to be thinking, oh, here he goes again. He's talking about prayer again. But it's like, well, I guess that's what Paul thought was important. And so that's where we are going to be, be focusing on a little bit today about setting our priorities. And at first, you know, we read that first verse and it says, uh, then first of all, and I thought, oh, good, first of all. That means there needs to be a second of all and a third of all. And I will have a three-point sermon that will be very easy to follow through the passage. But as I read it over and over, looking for that number two and number three spot, it really wasn't there. And as I dived more into really what those words were for, for first of all, it really meant, uh, this was, was Paul's way of saying, stop. If you do anything at all, this is what you need to do first of all. Paul wasn't setting up a list per se, but he was really telling Timothy, out of everything you can do, out of everything you should be doing, first of all, this is the most urgent. Above everything else, here's what you need to be doing. And you need to be, according to Paul, praying. Now I tell you, that doesn't sit quite well with some of the goals and some of the books about leading an organization. There's not much that's really uh, productive per se that you can check off of a list and turn in, uh, and turn in for the sake of, of accomplishing something. You know, Paul hadn't written a book that he was saying, you know, here's your first way to, uh, you know, seven easy steps to lead a church. You know, Paul wasn't trying to sell Timothy on a model of church. He was just going back to the basics. And he was just saying, you need to be in prayer. And it's just different. It's, it's different from what most, maybe most churches, let's just forget the business world for a few minutes. We'll just look at our churches. Many people, some maybe even here, will think the measure of a success for a church is in the three Bs. Maybe you've heard this before. It's in, uh, it's in bodies, one, for, one B, bodies in the chairs, buildings on our property, or what our budget is. And as long as everything keeps growing in those three Bs, the church is successful. And the advantage of leading a church where we have more senior saints is that you know that is not correct. Because most of us can pinpoint churches that are huge, that are what appears to be according to the three Bs, flourishing and doing wonderful things, but yet they're really falling short of the most basic things. In fact, there's some scholars, Black and McClurg, that say this about Paul's, uh, about what Paul should be doing. The, and the idea that, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, what Timothy should be doing and that Paul says you need to be praying. This is what they say. These are not add-ons, the idea of, of all of these prayers. These are not add-ons or afterthoughts for a godly leader, but they are the very heartbeat of the church. As a pastor, Timothy had leadership responsibilities that went far beyond reporting statistics and chairing committee meetings. And so as we think again about the church, 
as you think about the early church, we have this romantic idea in our, in our, in our minds that, oh, the early church, you know, Jesus was there. They were the perfect church. They never did anything wrong. They never had issues to work through. Everybody got along. And yet, uh, we, as we read, and especially in this uh, chapter, that, you know, things weren't all as smooth and squeaky clean as we have imagined. It's sort of like, you know, the engaged couple. Oh, my life will be just wonderful when I get married. Oh, I'm not going to have any worries or concerns once I get married. Oh, you know what? My, our, whenever we have kids, if we, they're just going to love me. My spouse is going to, to, to just affirm me with words or, or, or little gifts. Life, I just can't wait. And again, for those of us who are married or have been married, we know that isn't quite the case. You know, it's a lot of hard work. And so it is with the early church as well as our church today. And so, as every, again, Paul is saying right off the bat here, I urge you to be in prayer. And so, again, let me just recap because we all have this different image, again, of what prayer is. Prayer, again, is simply communicating with God. That's really what it is. And we know that communication is a two-way street. You know, if you have, again, any of your friends, any of your coworkers, if you're a boss and you have people who are reporting to you, uh, or if, uh, if you're overseeing other people, if you're in a relationship with somebody, uh, if you're in a marriage, I am sure somewhere you've thought or have said, you need to listen to me. You know, you're not hearing the word I say. You've got it all figured out. It's a, this is a relationship. This is a team effort. Let's talk about this. Prayer with God is the same way. It's really, uh, as I've shared, I don't know, a month ago or so, it's aligning our heart with the heart of God. And it's a two-way process. Not just me verbally saying things, but it's also me creating the space and the time to allow God to speak to me. To allow God to speak to my heart and to change or to give perspective or to give uh, uh, patience during certain situations. And again, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say it, but the consequence, there definitely is a consequence. There is a natural reaction to the closer our heart aligns with God, the, the more we are going to experience uh, the, the fiery darts of the evil one coming against us. And you would think that's the opposite, is that, God, I'm finally praying more. I really, you know, I'm getting up early or I'm staying up late or I'm, I'm using part of my lunch time or I've just scheduled it as, as a part of my life now. And should my life be better than this? Why is all this stuff, that's a politically correct word for something else you can plug in there. Why is all this stuff happening? And again, the reason is because if you were doing nothing, you are right in the, the grips of Satan. He doesn't have to spend any time trying to derail you. It's when you start to do something for the kingdom, actually take a next step, actually try to get involved some way, try to, to really in, improve your communication with God. It's when you start to do those type of activities that Satan is like, whoa. And when a church gets involved, trying to, to impact the world, not just to clean up a park, although those are great ways to connect uh, with our world, but as a church starts to, to make a difference in the kingdom for Jesus, you know, forget the, the fiery spears. Satan's going to be loading up those cannons trying to derail us and other churches who are doing good things uh, for the kingdom. 
So just be aware of that. Uh, and I just, I just feel compelled to, to always share that part because that's just the natural, natural consequence of, of being in prayer. Uh, and so again, let's take a look at, the, at these prayers. Again, verse 1 uh, says, I urge, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. This is not the first time that this writer has talked about these type of prayers. So let's take a look at Ephesians 6.18. You're going to see it up on the screen here. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for all of the Lord's people. And let's take a look at Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. And so back at the first chapter, Paul mentions four different types of prayers. And so, again, the petitions, when he says, you know, to, to make your petitions, those are requests for, for primarily personal uh, concerns or, or personal needs that you have. The second type of prayers is, is that word prayers, which is really a word that is much more generic when it comes to, to, to prayers. And it's the more of, a, of a, just a general conversation with God. Uh, something that you may have while you're driving, just, just more basic. Intercessions, that's really praying on behalf of somebody else. Uh, praying uh, for God to, to intervene. Uh, just really, it's not you focused, it's other people focused. And finally, uh, the prayers of, of thanksgiving, which really uh, is basically worship people that we need to be a people who have, uh, who worship and that, uh, that our prayers for asking for things and requesting things and for God to move in situations should never be separated from the idea of our worship and our praise to God. Again, it, it seems so simple, but for Paul, prayer is more important than any other aspect of the pastor's life. So that's a pretty high standard uh, for us pastors. You know, it doesn't say, oh, Timothy, what your first responsibility is, is go for those young kids. Paul doesn't say, Timothy, as a pastor, you've got to go for the senior people of the church. Basically, they're the ones funding the church. And if you don't please them, you're not going to have any money. Paul doesn't say that. Paul doesn't say, oh, above all, I urge you to make hospital visits. That isn't what, what Paul's saying here. And not that any one of those, those areas are not legitimately concerns and areas that people need to focus on. But to the pastor, he is saying, you need to be praying. You need to be a, a person of prayer and that needs to be a priority because it really does set the foundation for everything else. It sets the foundation for when Satan throws his darts or aims his cannon at you, that you are on a sure foundation that nothing can shake and that is Jesus. And, and he ends this. See, my Bible's in, I got the large print Bible it's still not large enough. Uh, and so that's why I usually just keep it on my 24 font notes. Uh, so again, he says uh, at the end of verse one, uh, and give, give prayers of thanksgiving, be made for all people. And I think that's where many of us have a challenge. For all people. Not just people that look like you, not just people that drive the same car that you drive, not, this, not the people who vote for the Dodgers or for those other people. It's for all people 
we need to be praying. And again, it's not, it's a two-way street that God listens to your concerns and he also listens to your celebrations, but it's also a time for God to speak into us and especially in the area when it comes to people. And again, I think, you know, how does God speak to you? Uh, you know, unless you're smoking that stuff that's been legalized recently here in California, I don't think it's going to be an audible sound. You may need to see a doctor if it is. There's, okay, and when you, I, okay, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep focused here. Uh, you know, it's not going to, you know, the light, you know, you're not going to see lightning zapping from here and, and you're giving me the words to say. It's that inner it's that inner calling, that inner speaking, that, that's why you do some of the things you do. That's why you make the phone call to your friend in your life group because you realize, oh, I told him I'd pray and I haven't. Let me just check up on, on him or her. That's why you call your son or your daughter because of that inner urging. That's why you come home and you say to your spouse, oops, I blew it last night. I apologize. Those are, the, those are the times when God speaks to you uh, that, that is really needed as we dive into prayer. But again, I just, let, let's put it this way. We have a hard enough time remembering to pray for the people we love, for the people we're married with, for your kids. You know, not because you don't love them, not because you don't care for them. It's because, you know what? You wake up and you're off and running. And all of a sudden, oops, it's the end of the day. All of a sudden, other pressures that are very real and, and legitimate, paying the bills, working with your boss, working on those projects, all of a sudden those take up some priorities, which are really real priorities for you. And it's the end of the day, and you haven't even prayed for the ones that you love most dearly. But yet Paul's saying, you know, pray in all these different ways and for all of God's people. And, and why? Let's look at verses 3 and 4. Pretty simple here. There we go. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants not just the Dodger fans, not just the people you get along with, not just the people who dress like you and I'll even say smell like you, for all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And again, it is just so hard to even pray for our, our closest family and friends. And then for others, those are people you know, but then, you know, you're, you don't have anything against them, but they're just other people. And then you got those that you just don't want to even give the time of, of day to them. That you could really even care less about them. It's these other people that maybe we need to, if you're a human like me, you need to, to expand your prayers. Where you need to be intentional with your prayers. And, and you've done it or... Maybe you've learned to do it or you're learning that at times, yes, Lord, I want to pray. I do believe in prayer. I know it works and it changes me and aligns my heart with you. But man, it's just easier to do it once a week when I come on Sunday. And so there are plenty of ways for you to, to remember, for me to remember. You know, I'm a three by five note card kind of a guy. I put those things on, on three by five cards and every month or so I got to clear out my desk because they're everywhere. Uh, maybe you're a post-it kind of a person. Maybe you're the, let's put it on my refrigerator with the magnets if people still do that. Uh, you know, maybe it's like even with my iPad, I have a post-it here with some notes. Uh, maybe it's in electronic form, you know, uh, that you have some document uh, that helps you, that just goes down the list of people. Because why? Because you're not opposed to it, but you just don't remember. And again, by praying, it pleases God and it aligns our heart with God's heart so that we get that broader perspective of a relationship 
that broader perspective of a, of a situation, that broader perspective even of our own life. Uh, in our own call again, uh, Paul mentions it three times in these first few chapters, the idea again of praying for all people. And again, it is people, it is easier said than done. But let's look at, at first verse five. Uh, it says, for there is, again, let me, for, uh, for Paul is clarifying some stuff. Because there are a lot of different beliefs out there about how many gods who, uh, and stuff like that. So Paul is throwing some theology into his, his, his call to prayer when he says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. That is key for us. Because again, even in Paul's world, there were a lot of people praying to a lot of different gods and, and Paul is narrowing it down. Paul, here, what we would say is, Paul is not saying, Let's, it's time to be spiritual. Oh. Play a little Neil Diamond music and get spiritual. Oh. No, Paul is saying there is one God and one mediator. And he has drawn us right back into what they would know, their First Testament, their only testament, because they don't, didn't have the New Testament, is saying, no, there is one God, creator of heaven and earth, and that is who we should be praying to. Uh, and again, he, he clarifies, because while you should be praying for everybody, you don't pray to the king, to the city mayor, you pray for the city mayor. You pray for those in leadership. You don't pray to those in leadership. And so Paul was just sort of clarifying things in case somebody was out there thinking, oh, I just got to pray to whoever about whatever. And we could be thinking, oh, but Paul didn't have the kind of, kind of uh, leaders we have today. Why would he say to pray for them? Well, if you sure remember, there was a guy named Nero who was not a good politician. And Nero was still the guy that, 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 uh, that put the, uh, the order into place to execute Paul. And yet Paul says, pray for those in leadership. He just comes out and says it. And, and you know, f- let's just face it. For many of us at times, we, uh, we do make gods out of our leaders. You know... Uh, someone pitches a no hitter, or they keep they they hit the scales for their all these records for their home runs, or they just make the killer song that everybody is singing. Uh, they do something that is great uh, in the world's eyes, and sometimes we make those people our kings. We almost elevate them to the sainthood. I see this often in funerals. It's like, they don't tell me one thing bad about Aunt Susie, but she was not a pleasant woman. And all of a sudden I'm doing this funeral like she's the Mother Teresa. And I know she isn't. Sometimes you think that about pastors. Hopefully not me, because you know, he ain't no king or whatever. He is not perfect. But we do, we do, oh, your child, grandchild, You know, my parents thought my daughter, Mackenzie, was the best thing in the world, and and they were right. (laughs) But you know when you have those grandkids and your children that there is nothing better, and we really do elevate them. Now, we won't say that they're a God status, but we put them up high enough. And Paul just reminds us that, yes, we need to be praying for everybody, but these people were praying for them, not to them. And so the reality is here, we are in voting season, people. Now, I don't know about you. I was gone for, the, for a conference. I came home and my mailbox was jammed. And all it was, excuse me, all it was was flyers from every politician about every situation trying to get my vote. And I know there are some churches that wouldn't even go this far to be saying, to be even mentioning that in a church service. 
But yet, I'm not, you know, when we say pray for everybody, if, you're, if you vote a certain way, let's just say you vote Democratic, you're not a Democrat. You're not a Republican. You are first and foremost a follower of Jesus who votes certain ways. And, and we all know people on both sides of that coin that could spin us a sermon and say why you should vote only this way or why you should vote this way. So that is not my purpose today. You are to be praying for the person that you're going to check that box for. Mine's an absentee ballot. That's almost done. Uh, you're going to check the box for. You need to be praying for the other person. Not damning him or her to hell. But you need to be praying for them. Praying for people at the office that you just like, ugh. Because why? Well, Paul sort of lays it out there for him that it pleases God and that it is our job, our responsibility to be praying for all people because they indeed need the prayer and God is very pleased when we do that. And so again, for us, it's for our, our city council, it's for whatever positions that people are going, that honestly, I get all this stuff, it's like, I didn't even know this was a position. <laughs> I better get online and figure out what I'm really voting for. Uh, and so uh, God just calls us to be responsible and to actually vote. And for those of you who don't vote, that could be a sermon. But anyway, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to go there on that. But okay, let's look again uh, how Paul, he does a great job in these first seven, seven verses just about reminding people uh, of, of the theology. And so, uh, and so the idea of, of setting our priorities and keeping them. Paul lays that out again. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, blow through these real quickly here. In verse 3, again, Paul says that he insists that there is, in fact, a God. Verse 7, I mean, verse 5, Paul asserts that there is just one God, not many gods. And that's the God we should be praying to. Verse 5 again, Paul points out that God and his creatures are not the same. Now, the big word for that is pantheism. They're not, the, God created the animals. God is not the animal. Did you, and so Paul just, just sort of laying this all out there. Why? It wasn't because he was bored and he was Mr. Intellectual and wanted to throw all these big words out there. Because it was going on within the people. Some of this talk. And, he's, and he was just bringing them back, back home to, to the reality. Uh, again, again, uh, Verse 5, for there, verse 5 is a great verse. For there is one God and one mediator between God and, and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. And so, you know what? There may be several ways to get to LAX, but there is really only one way to get to God. And that is what uh, Paul, again, is emphasizing. Our culture would not like us to say that. But as we look at scripture, we see it over and over. And again, in, in verse 6, as you, as you look at that, this passage reveals that, there, that, that God is also man. And that the man, Christ Jesus, gave himself a ransom for, again, all people. Not just those who live in the United States. Thank, thank you, Lord, that that's not his plan. But for all people. That's why... Pastor Ricky's having that meeting on November 4th. You know, for, for some who just think, you need to expand your worldview a little bit and see how God really is at work in places beyond our own, our own city here. So let me just go right to verse 7 here and, and wrap up things a little bit. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a true and faithful, I am not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Again, it feels a little bit like Paul is trying to uh, defend his credibility, because there's no doubt he stepped on some toes in, in those previous verses. He talked about issues and concerns with, with 
several gods and, you know, is God man and, and who did Jesus die for? He touched on all of those things. And so the important thing, again, is that he is saying we need to pray for everybody. We need to be praying that they come into a right relationship with Jesus. We need to be praying that they come into a, a, a full understanding of the truth. Not just to have it a head knowledge, but to have it transform their heart so that they themselves can see the wonder of God. So they can rely on the strength of God. So they can in confidence know that the God of creation of heaven, the God of creation of the earth loves them deeply. And that's why we need to be praying for everybody, not just those that we're good old buddies with. It's not the, it's not the, uh, the old boy, what's it, that, uh, good old boy network when it comes to the kingdom. We need to pray for every man and every woman that they will know that the tangible stuff, and again, those of us who are getting older realize this probably more than some younger people at times, but the tangible things in life are never going to make you complete, are never going to give you the lasting joy and peace. Praying for others to know Jesus gives them that. So really your dream home will never be as big or as fancy or as modern as it probably could be. Your dream job will never uh, be without its own headaches and its own challenges. Your perfect health will soon be gone and won't last forever. Your Mr. or Mrs. Wonderful is really only human. You can't promote them to sainthood. And to know that your, your deepest joy is found in Jesus and not in a significant other. Because he or she is gonna, gonna blow it for you. And so true happiness uh, and lasting peace can only be found with Jesus. And so as, as Paul is handing off the baton to Timothy to take over this church that has some issues, he is calling Timothy back, or well, not even calling him back, but he's helping him to, to set the standard, to set the foundation uh, to be in prayer. Because we know uh, our prayers for the salvation of others is really what is going to give them the peace that they long for. In fact, we do have a, a part of our church history, the Reformed Church. We have a creed that uh, is called the Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, and it goes back to 1517. In fact, October 31st really isn't Halloween. It's really the day that this guy Luther pounded all these concerns about the church back then. He put them all on a door and nailed them on that door. He was considered a heretic for what he said. But out of that catechism, which is really, I think, 120, some of you know, 129 questions and answers about the faith. Uh, the first question and answer addresses this whole thing. And so this is the first question. You know what, Why don't, well, let's stand, let's read this together, folks. So it's the Heidelberg, Heidelberg Catechism, question one. Many of you, probably from halfway back, know if, well, we're in Florence, you probably know this. Uh, what is your only comfort in life and death? And the answer is, let's read this together. It should be coming. Here we go. Okay. Answer, here we go. That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood, and he has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things may work together for my salvation. 
Because I belong to him, Christ by his Holy Spirit assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. You can go ahead and, and, and be seated. Again, an ancient creed that goes back hundreds of years is relevant to us today. And again, some of you may be thinking, yeah, but the Bible wasn't written for us. Oh, but it was directed to us as well. And so what Paul wrote to Timothy years ago about a church, we can apply to us here today. We need to be praying for others, all others, for our friends and for our family, for those that you know and for those that you don't know those you like and those who really rub you the wrong way. You need to be praying for your enemies and those who would just like to, you know, to do you in. You need to be praying for them. And we, especially in this season, need to be praying for our elected officials. No matter who you voted for, we need to be praying that they can experience the peace of God which passes all understanding. And God's people said, amen. And so we now move into our response time. This is not just a filler time. It's a time to sit. Maybe you're going to sit. Maybe you're going to sing along with some of the songs. Maybe it's your prayer time. It's a response time where, where we give back to God a portion of our financial resources. Again, as a way of just saying, you know what? Money doesn't dictate me and I am learning more and more to give generously. We also have a, a response and you know, the uh, worship team can come back out. Okay, there they are. Uh, you can respond by lighting a candle. Uh, again, Jesus is not in the candle. We're not praying to the candles. It's just a simple reminder of a prayer for maybe somebody that you don't like, for somebody that you don't know, for somebody at work that just bugs the heck out of you. Maybe you need to light a candle so that you can remember to be praying for them. You can come forward here or in the back and we'll have people that will walk up to you if you, you don't want to come up uh, to, to celebrate uh, communion through the bread and through the cup where you take a piece of the bread off and then you dip it in the cup as a reminder of, of God's love for everyone. Not just for a neat little thing to do on a Sunday morning, but as a tangible reminder of the love of Jesus and the power of his resurrection. And so if you need that, again, you, we just encourage you to celebrate that. And if you wanna go and, and nail maybe somebody's name on the cross that you're praying for, a concern that you have, uh, you are welcome to do that during our response time. And ushers, why don't you come on forward? I wanna, I wrote it on my little post here. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we did our Change for Christ, which we gave to Long, uh, Long Beach Rescue Mission. And that was $2,235. You can hold off passing uh, just for a second. And so let me congratulate you and, and thank you uh, for your generosity. Long Beach Rescue Mission does a wonderful work uh, within the city for those who are homeless. And we're gonna, uh, Linda's gonna be doing Christmas stockings again. You'll hear more about that later. And I think we gave a couple hundred in the past uh, to help minister, to help partner with this ministry. So let us go ahead and respond to God this morning. 